Good morning passengers, welcome to Martel Air. My name's Amanda and I'll be your pilot for today. We're just beginning boarding for flight number 18 from Coffs Harbour to Coolangatta Gold Coast, Gold Coast Airport. So grab your seats while I finish up the last steps of the pre-flight inspections of this Cessna Grand Caravan, the pride of the Martel Air fleet. Okay, before engine start checklist, pre-flight inspection complete, parking brake handle set, our electrical system switches off, ignition switch normal, fuel tank selectors both on, bleed air heat switch off, power lever idle, Prop RPM lever max, fuel condition lever cut off, fuel shut off knob fully in check, battery switch on, cabin lights on, cockpit lighting set, flaps up. No smoking lights on. Before engine start checklist complete. The weather today is nice and sunny in contrast to our flight into Coffs Harbour where it was horrendous and somewhat icy. And we'll be cruising at an altitude of about 8,000 feet flying over the fascinating Mount Warning en route. Your cabin crew today is myself and Wing Commander Lamington. <coughs> and your emergency exits are located to the back of the cabin where you entered the plane. I also have a door up here by me, and if you see me leave, please follow me quickly. Our in-flight catering services are provided by our wonderful passengers, so I hope you packed something interesting. Engine start checklist. Battery switch on, beacon light on, avionics one on, bus volts check, emergency power lever normal, inertial separator handle to bypass. Engine information system readings check. Propeller area clear. Fuel boost switch on. Fuel boost on shown check. Fuel pressure load not shown check. Fuel flow zero check. Starter switch start. Ignition on, shown, check. Oil PSI, check. NG, stable. Fuel condition lever, low idle. Fuel flow in expected range, check. NG, climbing. NG stable. Starter switch off. EIS readings check. Generator load check. Generator off not shown check. Battery amps positive check. Fuel boost switch normal. Avionics 2 on, and nav lights on. Engine start checklist complete. We're now ready for departure. 
So please fasten your seatbelts and turn off your devices, apart from those used to watch this stream. Thank you for flying Martel Air, we hope you don't die. Okay. Oh yes, there are a lot of cockpit lighting knobs. So, we have avionics lights, which is the brightness of all of my wonderful panels here. Standby indicator lights, which is these little backup instruments that are much more mechanical than the wonderful glass cockpit. So if all the computers crash, I have to fly by look out the window, but also look down at this little row of four dials that gives me the bare minimum to not crash. And then we have the LED panels and enunciator light brightness, which is a lot of little things around the plane, many of which are hard to see in daylight. And then we have the left floodlights over the uh, cockpit panels. We have the center floodlights, which is a little hard to reach past the bypass handle. And we have the right floodlights, which controls Wing Commander Lamington's uh, panel brightness. So if I grab that knob. And it also, you know, kind of shines on the back of Wing Commander Lamington to give him a nice halo, as he deserves. And yes, they are very satisfying clickety-clickety knobs. Okay, before departure taxi checklist. Taxi lights on. Seatbelt lights on, so everybody better buckle up. Taxi clearance. Off ground, Bartel 18 with information Sierra, request taxi for takeoff, departure to the north. Taxi 2 and hold short runway 03 via taxiway Charlie. Echo 2, Echo 1, Alpha, Martel 18. Taxi clearance check. Nav source set. Prop RPM to minimum. Fuel condition low idle. Inertial separator to bypass. And parking brake handle off. I do not have an actual pilot's license, no. Uh, it's something that would be quite cool to get at some stage, but also quite expensive because you have to do all of these uh, flights in the air and, you know, pay for the time with the plane, pay for the fuel, pay for the instructor. It does tempt me to someday try to get one, and after getting my pilot's license, one of the first things that I would be doing is taking my dad up on a flight because he used to be a pilot himself for real life flights and I think me taking him up on a flight would just give him such joy. But let's get this show on the Sky Road. Okay, so... And... I'm glad that there is support for this plan. And one of the wonderful features of the caravan and many turboprops is its ability to reverse. Why pay for some pushback truck when you have a thing on the front that'll push you back? is, of course, a vehicle without a rear-view mirror. Whether planes can reverse or not normally is... Uh, whoop. Okay, one, fun fact. 
do not brake too hard when reversing because it will tip the plane back like that, but luckily we didn't have a tail strike. So, not all planes have reversible engines on them, and so most propeller planes, if they don't have a variable bit pitch propeller, uh, you can't reverse. And most jets, so you know, proper blowing air out the back jets that do have engines that have reverses on them. They are used as brake boosters for landing on short runways and the like, but not for um, reversing away from the gate just because of the chaos that you get from the jet wash blowback and a few other fascinating physics things. Um, so, you know, in general, airliners will get pushed back from the gate rather than pushing themselves back like that, just because it's not safe for ground personnel, it's not safe for, um, the terminal building itself, and it can cause some problems for your plane as well. But uh, propeller planes that have reversible propellers, such as both this and the Caribou, because, you know, I, I have my preferences in planes, apparently. If you can turn the propellers so that instead of... So, a variable pitch propeller changes how much of a bite the propeller takes out of the airflow, and if the airflow... So, you yeah, know... Generally, it'll be, do we want a bigger bite, smaller bite, etc. But it, you can also set it up such that it takes a negative bite and starts essentially pushing backwards. Um, generally, these are used for shortening your landing distances. Um, you never turn it on in the air. In fact, a lot of planes, especially jet airliners with reverses, have... One of the safety systems is a weight on wheel sensor. So if there is not weight on the wheels, you can't deploy the thrust reversers because it will just throw your plane out of the sky. Um, I don't believe that the caravan has that uh, safety system, but uh, I, I, I'm not going to be trying. So when I'm doing the uh, thrust lever checks at the start of a flight, you might notice that there's this range behind where I'm pulling the uh, idle position. And that is, it's called the beta range because it complicated technical term. And uh, it is used for ground handling such that um, you know, you're not using full, full flight thrust on the ground because you usually don't need it. And um, you're also... That's where they put the reverser. So essentially you pull it back past idle and it goes from forwards to backwards. I would show off the... Um, pitch um, variation stuff, but as it's currently spinning, you can't really see that. And yes, one of the things that it's interesting to see some people occasionally forget about planes is that they don't generate any forward power from the wheels. A few years ago, there was this whole argument as to, you know, a plane on a giant treadmill runway that's moving backwards at the same speed the plane's moving forwards. Could the plane take off? And, um, the plane 
is not generating any forward movement by pushing against the ground because if it did the minute it left the ground you would stop going forwards and that's not good in a plane look i stand by we hope you don't die as a motto for the airline it's accurate it's definitely something i hope for all of my passengers and here we come to the runway itself a little ways down the runway which means we will be doing oh now is this an intersection takeoff or are we backtracking Yeah, like, with, without the wheels, you would definitely have a much rougher ride on the ground than with the wheels. Like, it gets a little bit crunchy. There are planes that are designed to be able to do it once, but in general, not so much. And yes, the, you end up getting lots of close shots of the dashboard because I need to see some of these... Ah, oh, what year is this plane from? I will double check that. No, not the Dodge Caravan. So they started building the Grand Caravan in 1982. I suspect that this exact model of plane is from later but you do get also retrofits where you replace all of the manual instruments with the Garmin G1000 NXI suite and yes that is Garmin as in the ones who make a lot of the pocket GPS units as well and the car ones turns out they make full aircraft instrument suites as well it's quite fancy Cox Tower, Martel 18, ready for departure to the north on runway 03. Cleared for takeoff, runway 03, Martel 18. And now we do a backtrack departure because the taxiway only gets us to halfway up the runway. But we have our takeoff clearance, so we're allowed to be on the runway. But we set our strobe lights and landing lights on for maximum visibility. There is a general rule of never have your strobe lights and landing lights switched off on the runway or switched on on the taxiway, basically because they make you very visible. So a backtrack departure is one where you have to drive backwards along the runway to reach the end of the runway and then turn around and do your departure as normal. So at an airport where the taxiway reached all the way to the end of the runway I would just pull into the runway about here but as Coffs Harbour does not have that we use this lovely tight turning circle to do that here. Okay, parking brake set. For four takeoff checklist, parking brake set, altimeter QNH set, standby flight instruments check, fuel boost switch normal, fuel tank selectors both on, fuel tank quantity check, fuel shutoff knob fully in check. Anti-ice system not required. Inertial separator handle normal. Autopilot setup. Altimeter bug set for initial cruise. Flight level change mode set, and flight level change speed set to VY, 
heading mode set and set to a runway heading bank mode engaged autopilot prepared nav source check transponder on alt flaps to take off position take off clearance check strobe lights on landing lights on seatbelt lights on parking brake handle release fuel condition high idle prop rpm to max before takeoff checklist complete and advance the power Martel 1A, continue for north to Poucher acknowledged. Yes, aviation uses knots and nautical miles. There is a fascinating mix of different units used in aviation just because of historical things. But, uh, I mean, at least partially it's that a lot of uh, aviation things start mix, started off mixed up in naval things because they had to work out, you know, for example, which military branch would be in charge of um, aircrafts and it started off blended between the army and the air force or uh, the army and the navy they both had their own air force and yes the uh, the scenery in flight sim 2020 is in fact pretty good they keep working on it every Oops, wrong button Wanted that button um, and, yeah, get across the big water, friends. Okay, let's engage nav mode and turn towards our path. 2,000 feet clearance, so landing lights off. Look, I have many buttons, very few of which are too, too wrong. Going to one two two decimal six Martel one A. Brisbane Centre Martel one A is type Cessna Caravan, five miles northeast of Cobbs Harbour, two thousand six hundred feet. Request flight following. Squawk six five seven one Martel one A. One of my favourite parts of the naval influence of, and nautical influence on um, aviation stuff is in fact the pilot's uniform, which is 100% based on the um, naval captain's uniform with the you know, four stripes for a captain, three stripes for the next one down, all that. It is entirely based on 
the uniforms worn on boats. Okay, cruise climb checklist. Anti-ice not required. Inertial separator normal. Airspeed set to VY. Prop RPM within required range. Engine temperature is acceptable. checklist complete. So the, yes, the, the modern pilot's uniform in fact started with the, it was one of the American airlines, I think Pan Am, that did um, flying boats for Atlantic crossings and the reason you, you like a flying boat for an Atlantic crossing back then is that, you know, you don't want to fly too far from a runway with early unreliable engines. So, might as well make it so that the entire path that you're flying over on the way there is a runway. This is what the ocean is to a flying boat. It's not a great runway a lot of the time. But yes, the Boeing Clipper fleet, and then to make it seem respectable and fancy, they put their um, flight crew in what was essentially ship's uniforms and it just kind of stuck from the Boeing Clipper fleet. I've done a longer rant about that in one of the previous videos, but uh, we've got some unfamiliar names in the chat, which is just so exciting for me. And we've got some lovely views out over the New South Wales north coast today that we unlike last week's flight we can actually see so we're definitely getting into the sort of territory where people love to go for uh, surfing and we're getting much more into the surfing sort of territory the further north we go so we are flying to a Gold Coast or the Gold Coast depending on exactly how you're phrasing things the Gold Coast is the next largest city south of Brisbane on the Australian East Coast. Uh, Gold Coast Coolangatta Airport is in fact on the uh, New South Wales Queensland border, as in the border goes through the middle of the runway, which is uh, It makes you glad that Australia doesn't have quite as much state versus state squabbling as some other countries do. Because the uh, yeah the runway going straight down the middle would, would cause some awkwardness. So, depending on which direction the air traffic control directs us to land from. We might be landing in Queensland or New South Wales and then once we get there I believe that the parking itself is on the Queensland side. Um, but yes, the, the border is literally that close like running straight through the middle, not in line with anything at all. And we are getting to the northern extent of the parts of Australia that I've actually been to myself in real life. Um, just hopping over behind Wing Commander Lamington to get a look out his side at the lovely views over the Pacific Ocean. Yes, this is my beloved co-pilot. Oh, that's not really the passenger seat. These are the passenger seats back here. This is the co-pilot seat. Let me 
just to double check what I... So yes, um, this is my co-pilot, Wing Commander Lamington Pavlova Vegemite Skymaster Martel. So you know, he watches the instruments, yells at me if I get too distracted, makes sure that everything is uh, all going safely. And, okay, so, the way that twin control aircraft like this work is, um, just one moment. Brisbane Centre, Martel 18, request clearance to transition Charlie airspace. Cleared through Charlie airspace, Martel 18, acknowledged. So the Pavlova in his name is not named after the uh, psychiatrist Pavlov. It, he, it is in fact named after the Australian dessert Pavlova, which is, imagine a giant moist cake-sized meringue covered in fruit and whipped cream. Just setting the cruise power since we've leveled off at 8,000. Um, but yes, one of my firm beliefs is that corgis go best with food names. Like, it just works so well. Okay, there's the cruise power settings set. No, pa Pavlova is... There are arguments as to whether it's named after... Uh, whether it was invented in... Australia or New Zealand, um, named after the, I think, ballerina Anna Pavlova as a tribute. But yes, it is a, you know, about that big usually, or, you know, big that thick. Um, basically meringue as a cake, and then you cover it with whipped cream, sliced fruit, uh, strawberries and kiwi fruit, are popular and then you get passion fruit and use it almost like a yeah the insides of passion fruit and use it as a sauce it's just it's excellent for summer so you know popular at um, Christmas parties no pa Pavlova's a cake sized rather than corgi sized oh fresh homegrown strawberries on a Pavlova yes but yeah, so it, it is essentially something like meringue, but because it's thicker, you don't get the inside baking to dry. It stays moist and such inside. It's it's sugar, eggs, and air basically, and so good. But yeah, so Wing Commander Lamington has three foods in his name. Lamingtons are a vanilla sponge cake slice covered in chocolate sauce that's then rolled in um, shredded desiccated coconut and of course the great thing about um, meringues in Australia is that we also have our own local variant other than the pavlova which actually comes back if you throw it hard enough it's called the boomerang also, that same joke can be used for if you make a Halloween-themed meringue that scares people. There is no relation between boomerang and meringue in actual fact, but I love dreadful puns. We are definitely into the flat with flat bits part of Australia in this particular section. We can see some other crinkly bits further inland, but we are definitely north of the Blue Mountains and the Great Dividing Range now, which gets get, gets a bit interesting. And then we've got just straight out into the Pacific Ocean.
Okay, cruise checklist. Seatbelt lights off. Anti-ice system. We're just on the edge there, so pedostatic heat on, stall heat on. Inertial separator to normal. Power lever set for 89% check. Prop RPM to 1750 check. Fuel balance check. Temperature range exceptionally check. Look, whether we're in Discord or not is entirely irrelevant when you just kind of absorb um, the use of emojis into your text dialect. And yes, it, it's something of an in-joke. And to an earlier question, before we got distracted by a few things, um, once you get up to cruise, whether the captain can get distracted, slack off and boogie? Uh, technically, yes. In airlines, there are rules against it because, uh, essentially, if anything goes wrong or starts to change unexpectedly, you want somebody to know what's going on. So. Oh look, I get I get stuck on tangents a lot, but it it was an interesting question with you know a good bit of rambling to happen to it, so it would, you know suck in the head a bit. So what the pilot of a passenger plane is doing in the cruise section is monitoring the instruments, so making sure that the engine's behaving itself, making sure that the autopilot is holding the navigation correctly, watching out for weather changes talking to the various air traffic controllers whose territory they're flying through, making sure that the plane isn't starting to ice up as we had last week, you know, making sure that we're on course, at an acceptable speed, at the correct altitude, the engine's behaving, the fuel situation is fine. It is a much lower stress situation than the take off and landing phases because that's when you have both pilots absolutely focused as you would hope because essentially the only way that a plane crashes is by making contact with the ground. Um, if something weird happens to the engine when we're at 8,000 feet or you know in an airliner at 30 something thousand feet you've got time to correct and pull up and then not explode. If something goes wrong while you are, let's say, a hundred feet from the ground and trying to fly towards or away from the ground, then you have a lot less time to react to fix things. Import most important buttons to not die when in cruise are... I mean, in general, the important thing with most of these buttons and switches when you're in cruise is to not press them unless you need to. For example, if I look up here, if I flip both of these knobs to off instead of on, that cuts off all fuel to the engine. Don't want to do that. Uh, this red knob down here is the fuel cutoff knob. Uh, you want that pushed in, if you pull it out, it cuts off the fuel. Uh, same with that little red handle, you pull that 
all the way back it cuts off the fuel and the engine stops and yes the recording of the live stream will be on YouTube and then once YouTube's finished processing it I'll do a slightly edited one where I um, you know, cut off the extra bit at the start and the bottom and fix up the description as a long-term recording. That get, that usually goes up within a day or two once YouTube's finished processing. Why do we have so many cut off the fuel immediately buttons? So, these ones up here are the fuel tank selector knobs. It's not that they are cut off the fuel immediately buttons so much as if if you have more fuel in one tank than the other where... So, the fuel tanks are in fact inside the wings. Most planes do this. You put the fuel tanks in the wings because the wings are getting pulled up by the lift so if the weight of the fuel is pulling them down they bend less which is just good for the mechanics of the plane. If you have more fuel in one side than the other which can happen for various reasons then you can set it to only take from one fuel tank instead of both which is a useful way where instead of trying to pump the fuel around you just you only sit from the tank that has more in it to start with and you know in some weird situations if the inside of the plane is out of balance you can um, fix that balance with fuel tank intentional imbalances it's a bit risky and it's better to just um, you know, balance your cargo on passengers rather than switching everything else up. And yes, uh, the plane rolling is based on the weight balance and the trim of the various flight control surfaces. Um, and yeah, flying is a matter of keeping all of those set properly. So, you know, if you've got an imbalance in the fuel tanks, you'll have to push against it with the um, ailerons so better to uh, gradually fix that imbalance instead of just letting it go now as for the fuel um, condition lever which is the red one of the three power levers down here that so on a turboprop like this plane it sets essentially what the idle speed is Ah yes, ailerons are the flight control surfaces that make the plane roll. They're the ones on the wings rather than the tail. Um, but yes, so the flight condition lever sets what the idle position is. On this type of plane it has high idle, low idle and cut off. And it is what you'll generally use for cutting... So you know, uh, on the ground you will use low idle so the engine's not pushing so hard while it's not actually doing anything. In the air you'll have high idle so that it's, you know, pulling the plane forward a certain minimum amount to keep the airflow nice and clean. And when you're shutting the engine down, you'll pull it to cut off. And the reason that has a fuel cut off is basically it controls some positions of things and it can control it all the way back to zero and then this nice red fuel slash oil shut off pull off knob that is the one that is actually for fully cutting everything and you might notice that it is fuel and oil and basically we have that knob because there are certain situations where instead of pulling it making you potentially die as it would in normal flight sometimes pulling the fuel and oil shut off knob will make you not die and that situation is if the engine is on fire going to 120.3 Martel 18 goodbye Brisbane Centre Martel 18 entering your airspace 8000 feet so yes, uh, the fuel and oil shut off. If the engine is on fire in the way that you don't want it to be, like, you know, there is fire in the engine at the moment uh, 
the, the temperature between the turbines is 560 degrees Celsius at the moment. Uh, but if it gets on fire in a way that you don't like, you pull this very conveniently placed fuel and oil shutoff knob and the stuff that's burning gets cut off. We like having those very quickly accessible. And yeah, we don't want the engines on fire in the parts of the engine that are not the place for the fire. Most engines are on fire somewhere, just, you know, very specifically contained and directed. And yes, we do have some nice and much friendlier than last week clouds. The, uh, just some nice volume and just fluffy bits, but not huge ice plugs of doom that try to ice the plane up and all this sort of thing. Anyway, there are some other buttons in here that if I were to push them it would be a bad time. Um, door handle, try to open that in flight, might have a bad time. Although since it's not a pressurised plane, not as bad of a time as you might otherwise in the planes that are physically impossible to open in flight. Let's see where you are. We have another 29 minutes on route. Lovely. Outside air temperature is 5 degrees. And we've got a true airspeed of 146 knots. 8 knot tailwind and the ground speed of 160 knots. And yes, the joys of a small non-pressurised plane is that we are not flying along at the 30 something thousand feet of an airliner because nobody in the plane will be breathing particularly well there. We are instead flying at the altitude that is what airliners pressurise their cabins to because it is a comfortable higher altitude. Generally this plane is allowed to fly to about 12,000 feet with passengers. I believe its operational max is... So yes, uh, about 12,000 feet is the safe with passengers altitude. Um, generally you'll tend to stay at about eight to 10,000 for these sorts of flights. Um, for non-passenger flights there is an oxygen system that's part of this top panel here and in that sort of situation where you've only, where you know, you've converted this to a cargo variant by taking out these seats and just filling it with stuff um, and then you hook the oxygen supply up for the pilot and co-pilot only. And yeah, so pressurised planes will go to, you know, some of them go up to 40 something thousand feet depending on the particular which airline you're in and what route they're flying but they will pressurise the cabin so that the inside is the equivalent of 8,000 feet. And so one of the gauges that they'll have in the cockpit of an airliner is cabin altitude. Oh yeah, um, airliners typically fly at 30 to 40,000 feet. Um, this is why they are pressurised and it's why you get um, some weird like, it's why the doors on airliners are so beefy, is that they are holding the air pressure difference between um, you know, the inside of the cabin at about, at about 8,000 and the outside at, you know, 34, 36,000. Yeah, if you convert it from thousands of feet into any, like, normal, perceivable sort of 
distance number, it's a ridiculous distance up. Uh, the reason that you... Uh, the reason that airliners fly that high is that the thinner air means that they are pushing against less and the same speed through the air okay many caveats on that statement but the speed through the air that the plane flies at being relatively constant the the speed across the ground goes up ridiculously and my thoughts on the plane with the door coming off uh, that's well, technically it was a door plug, it was a blank thing in the place where you could put a door, there is some complicated engineering on that, but uh, yeah, that's terrifying. Um, I've seen a lot of analysis, I'm assuming you mean the Alaska Air Flight, it'll be what, a while ago now, but relatively recently, unless there's been another one that I've not heard of. Um, I mean, it's terrifying that it happened, but look at the fact that that plane landed safely, and uh, it says something about all of the airline procedures around what you do when things go weird. Um, so, you know, engineering fail, but very good procedural stuff from the pilots and the people preparing their checklists of... They landed that plane safely. So, you know. It's a bit of a mixed bag there. Just checking the engine stuff. And, yeah, the capitalism involved in that. And the terrifying, terrifying things involved. Uh, yeah. We have some lovely forests slowly getting in towards rainforest sort of territory. And we've got some farms and we've got the more of the Pacific Ocean and these lovely wide beaches. And yeah, so the reason that we have such thorough checklists for everything is that uh, and yeah, my checklists are very very brief compared to the real ones with all of the emergency procedures but the reason we have so many checklists for aviation is that it um, makes makes it so that you know exactly what to do and you can't forget anything because you know you forget <coughs> if you forget one thing from what you're meant to do when getting ready to drive your car not too big a deal most of the time, but you know, you forget one critical switch when you're setting up for uh, flights, it might go a bit more poorly. And yes, checklist content is one of the things that I enjoy the most about doing this. They are so satisfying to work through. Because, you know, doing the sensible flying where we're just doing A to B and commenting on the terrain and interesting geography as we pass. That's, you know, I, I could do the standard YouTube streamer getting shouty about things and excitable. <coughs> But, uh, checklists are so satisfying. Um, I, I'll need to do another, um, caribou flight at some point soon. I won't be flying back to Canberra in the caravan before that. We'll just say that I, um, you know, drove down to do this other thing and something, something, the Role-playing details of the whole flight setup stuff gets a little complicated, but because you know I've got the 14-page uh, nice heavy card checklist document that I made 
for the caribou and it's printed in the you know, proper 1970s style it's so satisfying um, so on stream there have been two crashes both in the um, Tamora Air Show uh, special where I was flying a Fokker triplane and doing aerobatics and demonstration stuff and uh, you know the World War One warplanes are machines designed to kill but before they'd worked out to not kill their own pilot that you know before they bred that out of the breed um, but you know I had a lot of fun with it um, while I'm playing off stream I've had a few more depending on what I'm doing um, since I'm not doing the complicated aerobatic stuff and you know I find the sensible flying I, f I find the sensible flying a bit more satisfying than the exciting stuff then you know I don't do the stuff that risks crashing too much and yes the uh, the Fokker triplanes engine has the cylinders bolted to the propeller and the crankshaft bolted to the plane so that all of the cylinders spin which you know is really good for um, cooling the engine because it is spinning through the airstream uh, gives you a massive rotational inertia that gets a little bit spicy and um, well see you uh, thank you for your company in the chat it's been nice having you hopefully I will see you on future streams but yes the uh, the uh, early rotary engines where they would just spin the entire um, engine case which made it for you know good cooling um, total loss oiling system that gets a bit splashy and the rotational inertia makes it an interesting one to fly and it is good to still have you and your trunk in the plane I in fact loaded this the plane up for this one at full cargo capacity as well which is why it was a little more sluggish on takeoff this is you know the the takeoff for this run was at full takeoff weight rather than the usual fill up the passenger seats but not the cargo pod i decided that you know doing it a little more heavily loaded would be a fun change so you know we're hauling a little bit of cargo from coffs harbour to the gold coast and we are in fact coming up we are about 26 nautical miles from mount warning so yes, we have a, uh, our flight path has an overflight of Mount Warning on the way in, which is an extinct volcano remnant. So it is the lava plug from the middle of a volcano that is no longer there, which makes it a very dramatic sort of shape. And the exciting thing about Mount Warning is its presence in the movie Fern Gully. So, for those who haven't seen Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, which is a um, cartoon movie from 1992, it uh, you know, might seem completely irrelevant as far as things go other than being a very pretty mountain in some tropical or subtropical rainforest but uh, Fern Gully is two words but yes so Fern Gully is a or oh, actually in the movie title I think it's often done as one word with a capital G in the middle yes so Fern Gully the last rainforest it is a m movie from uh, 
1992, that is the least subtle bit of environmentalist propaganda that I have ever seen. And I say this with love. And I'm just noticing... Ah, that is a little spot of sunlight hitting the green screen behind me. What fun. And just pushing it just out of the... Um, range where it will follow the green screen properly. Sorry, that was a weird little distraction. So yes, Fern Gully, one word in the movie title as far as I can tell. You have somebody that you've probably not heard of as um, a tiny fairy living in the rainforest. Um, she goes out into not the normal part and discovers the environmental evils of capitalism destroying the um, rainforest. Uh, she meets a bat that has escaped from a cosmetics and other medical testing lab voiced by Robin Williams. And the animated bat, Betty Coda, is, um, exactly as insane as an animated character keeping up with the voice of Robin Williams could be expected to be. And, you know, the giant logging machine that's working its way through the rainforest logs, you know, chops down the chunky tree that Hexus, the uh, personification of pollution, has been locked away in. Hexus being voiced by Tim Curry. And uh, so yes, you know, the, the story of you can judge somebody by what movie they first saw Tim Curry in. I met Tim Curry via Fern Gully The Last Rainforest, where he plays Hexus, the personification of pollution. And if his performance in the song uh, Toxic Love was uh, not going to turn me straight, then nothing will. I highly encourage looking up Toxic Love from Fern Gully. It's quite the uh, performance. Brisbane Centre, Martel 18, request clearance to transition Charlie Airspace. Clearance through tra Charlie Airspace, approval acknowledged, Martel 18. Oh yeah, like, I highly recommend the movie, it's, it's great, and, you know, despite being a, um, I an independently made movie, not, um, one of the big um, movie studios from the early 90s. Like, it's not a Disney movie, um, but it got picked up by 20th Century Fox for distribution, so that is why you can ever get a copy of it these days. Oops. What is that doing? We do not want the direct thing showing up. Thank you. But yes, so Fern Gully is in fact one of the locations down in the rainforests of uh, southern Queensland that we are just approaching, and um, one of the landmarks that they use in the movie as a nearby point is Mount Warning, which I believe is the particularly pointy peak directly ahead of us. Uh, the reason it's called Mount Warning is that this bit of the Pacific off here is where we're starting to get into the Great Barrier Reef. Going to 130.4, Martel 18, goodbye. Brisbane Centre, Martel 18, entering your airspace 8,000 feet. So yes, the thing about the Great Barrier Reef is that it is a large reef that is a barrier to shipping. Um, I'm just going to check 
the actual southern edge point of it. Um, so you get the protected area, etc., etc. Okay, so the Great Barrier Reef itself is north of Brisbane, um, which we are coming into the next city just south of Brisbane. But uh, there are more, like, you know, not technically part of the Great Barrier Reef reefs just off the coast here. So Mount Warning, which is indeed this lovely pointy volcanic plug here, let's... I don't know if we'll be able to see the reefs from the plane. Um, we will be landing on the coast at least, so that will be something. I am going to pull us off the standard setting and let's get down to 6,000 feet for a better view of the um, reef, a uh, better view of Mount Warning. This. So, reefs are fascinating things with many, you know, varieties. So, the one that you will see in Australia most often is the coral reef, but essentially a reef is an unexpectedly shallow part of water with the rocks in that is a hazard to shipping. Oh, there is another frequency handle. Go to 123.5, Martel 18, goodbye. Gold Coast Approach, Martel 18, entering your airspace 7,100 feet, descending 6,000. Yes, there we go. Lovely Mount Warning with its uh, pointedness. It is a very dramatic shape. And so, yes, when uh, Captain Cook was doing some of his explorations of the... Um, coast along here, he noted that this notable pointy mountain would be a good warning for your coming into the bit with reefs in, so the mountain that was his warning about the reefs, he called Mount Warning. This, an unexpectedly shallow bit with rocks is one of the general definitions of a reef. So a coral reef is one of these unexpectedly shallow bits where the um, interesting things on the rocks are also alive and fascinating. But, you know, you get reefs around the British Isles, and those are very much not coral reefs, because coral does not survive in waters like that. But yeah, so... The beautiful Mount Warning, oh I'm glad we came around this side of it, is uh, making sure not to, to drop the engine back to um, full idle for more than the descent. Mount Warning is the magma plug left over from a volcano, which you can kind of see the caldera of. So, uh, yeah. We are, in fact, basically inside an ancient volcano right now. And there is the plug of magma that was in the middle of it. And... It's uh, quite a sizable volcano. Also, exceedingly ancient volcano. Um, 
Australia is a fairly geologic... Um, I think if you get the dead magma plug, it counts as extinct. Because if that much of it has cooled, it's no longer even bubbling away so much. So yes, the uh, very pointy Mount Warning, and then we've just got all of the caldera around there. So yes, Australia has... So, because Australia is essentially at the centre of a tectonic plate, we don't have... Um, much in the way of vol active volcanism at the moment. Um, Australian geology is some of the oldest still existing. Um, there's parts of Western Australia that are one of the two surviving pieces of the first ever continent. The other one being um, the Canadian Shield, which is a big piece of super old continent in I think northeast Canada. So yes, those two bits are some of the oldest surviving parts of Earth's crust. Be and you get, you know, crust that isn't surviving basically because um, you know, as you get subduction and continent gets recycled into magma that gets built up into continent. Um, there's a whole bunch of fascinating geo geological stuff that goes on with plate tectonic. But, ooh, 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 ooh. There is a, a lovely view of that caldera and its magma plug. And you can see that arc just above where the plane is, is at four nautical miles from the plane. So it's probably, you know, about a nautical mile at least across. Big volcano. But yes, um, so yes, the first continent ever, um, I believe called Valdera, the two remaining parts of it that have survived that are about four billion years old from memory where the Earth, as a solid lump, is about 4.5. There are so many caveats on that number. Um, yeah, the two remaining 4 billion year old rock sections are a certain part of Western Australia and a certain part of Northern Canada. Because you keep getting new rocks made and old rocks. So, you know, one, worn away, and two, um, where you get um, tectonic plates being pulled under each other, the one that gets sucked underneath gets recycled into magma and then into the next set of tectonic plates. And if it pulls water in, yes, subduction is the correct term. They don't get shredded, they get melted. They get essentially pushed underwater and uh, the water melts them where water is the Earth's mantle because the continents are floating which seems ridiculous and they're also oh yeah erosion as shredding yeah although you keep the uh, you keep the tectonic plate when it gets eroded it just gets you know thinner and less interesting and you get new stuff built on top of it which is you know how all sandstones and similar happen. But yes, the reason that Australia's geography is like it is in so many cases is that the Australian continent as a piece of rock is so very old. Like, I'm sure at some point we'll do a flight over Uluru and you can see the ridiculous lump of sandstone sticking out of flat desert that used to be the core of a mountain. Like, I will do a lot more research onto how that works when I'm lining up to do a flight over Uluru. But, 
yeah, Australia just has a few geographical features that are really cool that are just the cause of ancient mountain ranges. Uluru is just the most singular, just sticking out from feels like nowhere one of those. Okay, so here we have the coast in our destination sort of areas. So, okay, so um, the tallest Australian mountain is Mount Kosciuszko, which we did an overflight of, of a while ago now, and it is 7,310 feet tall, which is uh, wheelchair accessible, is how I would describe Australia's tallest mountain. I have been to the top of it on a school trip. 2,228 metres, 7,310 feet. Quite low. And here we come up to the combined multiple towns. So, just to our right we have Tweed Heads, and then immediately following on from that, we have the city of the Gold Coast, and then just further up there, where you can just see the taller buildings, is Brisbane. And yeah, I think anybody who comes to Australia from Colorado would get low altitude problems on top of Mount Kosciuszko. So, this is, it's an interesting example of not quite urban sprawl, and Tweed Heads just here is in fact a twin city, because the Queensland-New South Wales border hits the tip of that headland. And speaking of that border, we have the airport that we are just coming into. So... And yes, the uh, Gold Coast Airport is in the Gold Coast suburb of Coolangatta, so it is officially called Coolangatta Airport, but and the the airport code for it is YBCG, where if you think Gold Coast, it should be GC. Colangatta Tower, Martel 18 is three miles southwest, 6,000 feet, with information golf to land. Fly left downwind, runway 14, Martel 18. Okay, so we set our heading to 140 for the runway heading marker. We drop down to Let's call it 2,500 feet. And we are currently flying in towards the airport for a direct overflight, so that is all good. And in fact, we want the reverse course of the runway. And you can see the lovely, wide, sandy beaches that are why this whole area is so popular for surfing and the fact that it is warm here. Oh yeah, the spinny knobs for the autopilot do make some good clicking noises. Very satisfying. So there is the airport with basically one street worth of houses between it and the ocean. Oh yes, flight sim graphics between the f 
first ones that I flew and now um, it's just such a fascinating difference like you know these like the source files for Flight Sim 2020 are actually um, based on Bing Maps uh, because you know Microsoft Flight Sim so of course it's Bing not Google um, But we are getting into the approach phase, so... Attention passengers, we're now approaching Gold Coast Coolangatta, and I've switched on the seatbelt lights, which means I'd like you to fasten your seatbelts. Enjoy this riddle and more as we come in towards landing, and thank you again for flying Martel Air. We hope you don't die. Okay. Anti-ice system off. Inertial separator handle on normal, multimeter QNH set, nav source is set, but idle. And let's start our turn back towards the airport. Approach checklist. Seatbelt lights on. Fuel tank selectors both on. Fuel condition high idle. Prop up EM to max. Flaps to approach position. Landing lights on. Inertial separator handle. Bypass. Brakes off. And yes, the uh, the difference in flight sim graphics between the earliest versions and now are amazing. Clear to land runway one four, Martel one eight. Um. One of the things that I did uh, last year was make an A3 poster of a um, CRT 4x3 monitor displaying the default screen of Flight Sim 95, which, you know, as we all know, is the Cessna 172 sitting on uh, the start of the runway at Miggs Field in all of its pixely glory. And that is a poster for my dad's um, computer slash hobby room, which I had rather a lot of fun designing, and it seems rather appropriate. Okay, final approach checklist. Seatbelt light on, flaps to landing position, which makes it want to pick up, which is kind of the point. Autopilot is off and monitoring the airspeed as we come in for a fully manual landing because that's the way we roll. So we are landing in the Queensland half of the airport. We will probably finish our landing roll in New South Wales and immediately turn around and head back north again. And for those who want some local uh, stereotypes and jokes. The joke name for somebody from Queensland is a banana bender. This is at least partially because um, bananas grow quite well in Queensland and you got to get the bend into them somehow so clearly that's one of the major industries for Queensland is bending bananas. And we are coming along at 500 and it is just saying 500 in my ear a lot. landing speed range. We are lined up nicely. A little bit of a crosswind. A 
little high, but that's fine. Sinking down, sinking down. Plenty of runway. If we land a little late, there's nothing going wrong. And the air calms down as we get closer to the ground. Little Flaps up, power to idle, make sure we stay on the runway, and some gentle braking. And I'm always amused by how my voice goes into that very calm, here we go sort of cadence when I'm coming into land because it's not a time you want to be stressed. And I found that doing that voice actually does make my landings better. Going to ground frequency on 121.8, Martel 1.8. Goodbye. And we stop off the runway. Parking brake on. After landing checklist. Flaps up. Anti-ice off. Standby alt power off. Before arrival taxi. Taxi lights on. Strobe lights off. Landing lights off. Seatbelt light on. Taxi clearance. Holy ground, Martel 1-8, request taxi to parking. Taxiing to General Aviation Parking via taxiway Delta, Echo, Alpha, Charlie, Golf, Martel 1-8. Taxi clearance check, inertial separator bypass, fuel condition low idle, prop RPM to minimum. Uh, attention passengers, we've landed safely in Gold Coast Coolangatta Airport. And the local time is 12.30 p.m. Please remain seated until the plane comes to a complete stop at what, uh, what whatever ridiculous parking spot they give us. Because queuing for the exit in an eight-seater makes you look even more ridiculous than normal. Okay, and before arrival taxi checklist complete. And we've got an airliner taxiing in front of us. Let's just check where they're going. They are going away from us, which is a lovely. And we double check that nobody's going to be driving out in front of us because that would be awkward. And I have got the taxi guidance markers set to their proper subtle setting again after the, that fun with the updates. So they now look like the same that you will get in a lot of the more fancy airports where you get little green lights on the taxiway to help you with navigation. Uh, some airports don't do this and will just have all of the taxiway centre green lights always on. And you can see the little studs for the blue taxiway edge markers and yes the uh, giant default 10 times the size of these blue taxi markers were so disturbing like the uh, tiny bl green arrows are slightly video gamey but I think that is related to the real approach but the okay I'm sure that if we were flying an airliner, the giant blue markers would look less ridiculous, but as it stands, they were nearly the size of this plane. And the big advantage of the taxiway markers is that, uh, 
I don't need to learn the layout of every airport I'm visiting. Um, often I, especially when I'm flying for my own entertainment, I will have the um, actual aerodrome charts up on my second monitor, but as it stands, I have the streaming setup on my second monitor instead. Which is where these, um, so you, know, you have these little signs here which tell you what taxiways you're looking at, which is part of how you navigate, but you also have the aerodrome charts which are the full map of the aerodrome to varying levels of detail. Um, so an airline pilot these days will have them on an iPad or similar. Um, and in fact many of the fancier aircraft that people have designed as third-party content for flight sim will have you know, a tablet inside the cockpit that you could pull out and use. And it's also used to change the plane settings for a bunch of things where they've made it configurable, which is very cool. Um, in the old days, you would actually print these charts off, and they are in fact available for free from the Air Services Australia website. And Flight Sim 2020 has the airport modelling accurate enough that you can actually use the real-world charts for flight sim usage. It's wild. Oh yeah, there's also subscription services for flight simmers to use to automatically pull up. I believe the main one is Navigraph database. Um, pigeons. Pigeons. Hit the pigeons. Um, But yeah, so when I don't have OBS open on the second monitor, I will sometimes have the actual Air Services Australia aerodrome charts open instead. Uh, and in fact, I do actually have the um, Kulangata aerodrome chart open as one of the things on my second monitor. It's just that um, OBS is in front of it at the moment. And that loud noise is that guy taking off. And we will just carefully pull into our parking spot here. And one thing that we're going to be very careful not to do is hit this building. And yes, the unexpected loud engine noise from one side was a bit of a moment. And, uh, yeah, it's from the fact that we are parking fairly close next to the, um, runway. But I think that is a good amount of space. We may, in fact, be a little big for this parking spot. Let's just use... So, let's just step outside the plane. Whoa, that is weird. We're just going to... Actually, let's use that external view. Okay, we're, we're a little bit big for this parking spot, but, you know, this is what they gave us. That will be good enough. And once I've done the shutdown checklist, I will show you one of those aerodrome charts, I think, because they're quite cool little documents. I guess in, in the old days you would have a folder full of them and before you flew anywhere in particular you'd make sure to have a copy of where, the ones for where you are, where you're going and anywhere you might go as an alternate in case of not getting to your initial goal airport. Okay, parking brake on, power lever, idle, Bleed air heat switch off. ITT range is stable. Prop RPM to feather. And we watch the torque drop. V 
fuel condition cut and the engine comes to a stop and we can see our propeller again Inertial separator handle normal. External lights off. Seatbelt light off. Uh, test engine passengers, this now concludes our flight from Coffs Harbour to Gold Coast Coolangatta, and we here at Martell Air hope you've enjoyed your time in our tiny sky bus. Please wait until I've opened the door and you can calmly deplane in an orderly fashion. Our baggage handling services today will be provided by our wonderful passengers, so thank you for not leaving any of your luggage behind. Any personal belongings left behind as you leave the plane will be assumed to be a present to the pilot and co-pilot, <coughs> and enjoyed thoroughly. Thank you for flying Martel Air. We hope you don't die. Now, a thing I was talking about talking about before is how the propeller works with its... Uh, various going forward and backwards. So that is the feather position where it is pointing forwards into the airstream and as I push the prop RPM all the way up you can see how it goes sideways to the airstream instead. Why is it not shifting? Anyway. Ah, because everything is shut down it is not fully doing its rotations. There we go. Ah, there we go. It's just quite slow. And if I pull... So if I go to max RPM and full engine reverser, it in fact twists a little further and starts to push backwards. But shutting down, we have all of our levers at minimum. Although we drop that to idle instead of full reverser. Okay. Internal lights, no smoking off, and cabin light off. Fuel boost off. And engine shutdown checks, NG check. Temperature range is approximately ambient check. And oil pressure is off check. Avionics 2 off and Avionics 1 off as we hear the electronics cooling fans all wind down and battery off and fuel tank selectors both off I love how you get even like little stickers up here and everything FAA mandated placards it's great but that gets us to the end of this uh, Sunday flight instead of Saturday flight. Um, once a month I have my Saturdays busy seeing my about-to-be eight-year-old. So I've decided that doing instead of doing a middle-of-the-day stream shifted to an early evening stream, I'm just going to do them as Sunday streams instead, which seems to have worked out quite well this week. Um, I'm just going to pull this up and pull this across to here. And double check that's showing properly on. Lovely. So, yes, this is uh, the main aerodrome chart for Gold Coast Kulungata Airport. And you can see that we've got where the runways are in black, and also where the terminal buildings are, also in black and it gives you headings of the runway, length and width, and the elevation at each end. So it's 21 feet off the sea level at one end and 13 feet off sea level at the other. And it gives you all of the taxiway markings and what letters are which directions. Um, but yeah, so that is the, you know, page one. There's uh, quite a few pages. Um, probably about two dozen pages for this airport which gives you all of the approach procedures, noise abatement procedures, detailed maps of the um, 
ground, all this sort of stuff. Many complicated things. But yes, so that gets us to the end of this flight and I believe the end of this stream. And I do like having the ground crew here just to give you some sense of scale on this aircraft that is actually a little bit bigger than it might look. And oh look, one of its twins, but from FedEx in the background. These planes are actually used, the, the Grand Caravan is used by FedEx a fair bit because, you know, fill that cargo pod and the cabin with letters and packages and you can get a decent amount into a small airport. But that is where we will leave everything for today. Thank you so much for the company as I fly us up to the Gold Coast and I will see you all next week.